Good morning. It's Wednesday, the 22nd of November here in London. This is the Bloomberg Daybake Europe podcast. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up today, Israel and Hamas back a deal for the release of hostages in exchange for prisoners and a temporary ceasefire. Sam Altman agrees to return to OpenAI as CEO just days after his shock firing. Plus, high stakes politics. Jeremy Hunt is expected to target tax cuts and growth in today's autumn statement. Let's start with a roundup of our top stories. Israel and Hamas have backed a deal that will free dozens of the hostages held in Gaza in return for a four-day pause in fighting and the release of a number of Palestinian prisoners. In the initial stage of the deal mediated by Qatar, Hamas will free 50 Israeli women and children held in Gaza. In return, Israel has agreed to release about 150 Palestinian prisoners. But Bloomberg's Bill Ferry says the agreement does not mean the end of the conflict. It's worth emphasizing that this deal is not uh, seen as a ceasefire agreement at all. Uh, Israel made that very clear. They've called this, um, and Qatar has called this, a humanitarian pause. The purpose is to get aid trucks going in, to get hostages out, to get some prisoners released. But Israeli government made clear in their statement that they view this war as continuing. They said that they are still chasing their goals of getting all the hostages freed, but also uh, to uh, basically eradicate uh, Hamas and its leadership. Bloomberg's Bill Ferry says a second stage of the deal could see the pause in fighting extended for a further day in exchange for the release of every 10 additional hostages held by Hamas. It's believed that as many as 240 people are being held captive in the territory. The developments come as international pressure grows on Israel to end its offensive in Gaza, which authorities in the Hamas-run enclave say has killed more than 14,000 people and triggered a humanitarian crisis. Now, the Chancellor will claim that the economy is back on track in an autumn statement that's expected to prioritise uh, tax cuts and growth. Jeremy Hunt insists that the government will be responsible with the nation's finances. Everything is on the table. I want to bring down our tax burden. Uh, I think it's important for a, a productive, dynamic, fizzing economy. Hunt is likely to prioritise tax breaks for business, including making permanent the so-called full expensing tax break and either income tax or national insurance cuts. Labour says the government's to blame for a, quote, national scandal of working age adults not in jobs. Binance has pleaded guilty to violating US sanctions and anti-money laundering rules in a $4.3 billion settlement that requires Chang Peng Zhao to step down as CEO and leaves him facing a prison sentence. The crypto firm broke US sanctions law by allowing transactions from terrorist groups, including Hamas. US Attorney General Merrick Garland. This is one of the largest penalties we have ever obtained from a corporate defendant in a criminal matter. We know that corporations only act through the individuals who run them. As CEO of Binance, Zhao willfully violated federal law that requires financial institutions to guard against money laundering and terrorist financing. Despite the ruling and Garland's words, the crypto market was mostly unchanged on the news. Some see the resolution of the dispute as, a turning, as turning a page on the past few years of turmoil. But hours after news of Binance's agreement broke, the US Securities and Exchange Commission accused rival exchange Kraken of violating securities laws. OpenAI has reached an agreement in principle for Sam Altman to return as CEO with a new initial board that includes Brett Taylor as chair alongside Larry Summers and Adam D'Angelo. Bloomberg understands the talks involve some of OpenAI's investors, many of whom are pushing, uh, were pushing for his reinstatement. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella also reacting to the news this morning on X, saying, we are encouraged by the changes to the OpenAI board. We believe this is a first essential step on a path to more stable, well-informed and effective governance. Now, the fate of OpenAI had been in limbo after the board of directors' shock decision to fire Altman on Friday. NVIDIA's quarterly earnings are receiving a cool reaction from investors. The tech company's growth beat analysts' expectations, but shareholders want more. 
Hopes that the AI industry will continue to boost sales have driven the share price to record highs recently. Speaking to Bloomberg, Matthew Bryson, Senior Vice President for Equity Research at Wedbush Securities, said competitors in the space are still way behind NVIDIA. When you look at what NVIDIA did um, in, in terms of revenue where you're, you're, and where they guided to, where you're talking about them doing roughly $17 billion in data center revenue tied to AI, you look at that versus the competition. So Intel is talking about doing a billion dollars in revenue next year. AMD got it to two billion. I think people are hoping they can do uh, closer to three or four billion. Nvidia is doing seventeen billion. So whatever they don't ship, it doesn't go elsewhere. It just gets pushed forward, and it's it's revenue in the future, which is a good thing. Matthew Bryson also says data center revenue at its business is tied to AI. NVIDIA is the best performing chip stock this year, beating rival Intel, which was previously the world's largest chip maker. Federal Reserve policy makers united around a strategy to, quote, proceed carefully on future interest rate moves at their most recent meeting. Bloomberg's Charlie Pellet has the story. According to minutes of the October 31st, November 1st Federal Open Market Committee meeting released in Washington, quote, all participants agreed that the committee was in a position to proceed carefully and that policy decisions at every meeting would continue to be based on the totality of incoming information. The minutes show the committee was willing to take a patient approach toward inflation while making future policy decisions dependent on incoming statistics. In New York, Charlie Pellet, Bloomberg Radio. In a moment, we'll look ahead to the autumn statement from the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt here in the UK with Bloomberg's Dan Hansen and also to the latest news on open AI, an agreement in principle for Sam Altman to return as CEO. We'll be speaking to Bloomberg's Matt Bloxham about that. Let's get more details first, though, on the latest developments in the Middle East, where Israel and Hamas have agreed a deal to free 50 hostages from Gaza in return for a four-day pause in fighting. Bloomberg's Simon Marks joins us from Tel Aviv for more. Simon Great to have you with us. What more can you tell us about this deal that's been agreed? Hi there. So this deal has been brokered overnight in the early hours of the morning. Israel has told us that there's an agreement to release 50 Israeli women and children held in Gaza. Uh, And in return, Hamas has put out a statement saying that Israel has agreed to release about 150 Palestinian prisoners Uh, also mostly women and children in in return. Um, Qatar, which has been mediating this deal alongside the US quite intensely in recent weeks, have said that they hope this will open up the opportunity to get more aid, humanitarian assistance in there. Um, And notably, you know, Israel is calling this a pause, not a ceasefire, but obviously, you know, four days, if if it holds, is essentially a ceasefire. Does it pave the way, though, for something longer, for a, for a longer ceasefire, perhaps even the possibility of ending the conflict? Well, in the fine print of the deal, there is an opportunity for additional days of, of so-called pause. Uh, Israel have said that for every 10 additional hostages, they would be willing to add an additional day of pause in the war. But at the same time, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, has been very clear to say this does not mean the end of the conflict and that their original goals to eradicate Hamas and de-radicalize uh, Gaza, etc., is, is still very much the state of aim. Meanwhile, Simon, you've been part of a team that's been looking at what happens in Gaza after this war ends. What sort of scenarios are officials preparing for? Well, it's somewhat of a bottomless pit of ideas with lots of conflicting um, interests. But, you know, the broad strokes, uh, the US president, Joe Biden, wants to see uh, a more moderate, reformed Palestinian authority from the West Bank move in to to Gaza. Um, Israel, on the other hand, for the moment, you know, opposes a Palestinian state and wants to keep the the West Bank territories, the occupied territories in Gaza as separate. Um, Israel wants total sort of security control, at least initially, over Gaza. Um, There's not a lot of trust, I would say, um, between Israel and other entities in securing Gaza and creating some sort of buffer so that acts on October the 7th don't happen again. 
And then there's, you know, essentially a huge debate around who secures. Are Arab troops involved? Is Arab money from the Gulf involved in securing Gaza? Uh, alongside U.S. guidance, there's a lot of people pushing in that direction, too. Um, Simon, what do Palestinians want? Well, the Palestinians, uh, obviously, it's a it's very broad. Um, at the yes. moment, they are being, um, you know, bombed. They are obviously pushing for a ceasefire. There's huge civilian casualties. I think the latest the latest figures on that are up towards fourteen thousand now. Um, so their interests at the moment are very much, you know, looking in that direction. And and it really, it all depends on whether or not Israel's stated aim of defeating Hamas pans out or not. Um, will elements of Hamas remain after this war? Certainly a lot of analysts seem to think that their ideology will remain. Um, and, and then it all boils down to whether or not the Palestinian Authority, which is a very weak body, considered rather sclerotic and corrupt, can actually come back and implement something on the ground. So there's huge questions around all of that. OK, Simon Marks in Tel Aviv, thank you very much for bringing us up to date on the latest developments in the Middle East this morning. Now, let's turn our attention to technology. OpenAI has reached an agreement in principle for Sam Altman to return as CEO. This according to a post on X. It's a fast developing story. Joining us now to discuss this breaking news, Matt Bloxham, our senior tech analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Very good morning to you, Matt. Um, so just the reaction in terms of Sam Altman returning uh, as CEO. Yeah, uh, personally, I'm not surprised. I mean, I think given, yeah, I mean, it's been a crazy few days, but I think given the strength of reaction from, you know, the majority of employees that they would leave uh, and go f follow Sam to Microsoft if the board didn't resign and reinstate him, then I, I kind of think you know, the, the board were backed into a, a corner and, you know, I think they risk just um, seeing the, the company unravel. Um, so I don't think they had really, really any choice. I think from here, the, the big questions are going to be, okay, what, what, what's the detail? What, what you know beyond a new board that looks more supportive of Sam Altman? Are there going to be more profound changes to the structure of the company? Uh, what does this mean for the possible IPO? Um, how are they going to kind of commercialise things like ChatGPT more effectively uh, to kind of take advantage of the opportunity that's there? This, there are several, um, just to emphasise, this is a story that's developing as we're talking to you about it, Matt Bloxham, but we have some other details. We've had a reaction from Satya Nadella from Microsoft praising the OpenAI board and governance changes. That's an important point we'll return to in a moment. We've also had the announcement of the new board. So Brett Taylor as chair. Larry Summers, interestingly, uh, joining the board of OpenAI with Adam D'Angelo as well. So this is something that will see changes in the way that this company operates, but also its relationship relationship with Microsoft, how important is it that that relationship has, has sort of remained steady throughout this drama in the boardroom? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely um, probably um, a lot more important to Microsoft maybe than it is to, to, to OpenAI because I'm sure there's a long list of, you know, alternative um, companies that would be prepared to kind of put up billions of dollars to support the development. So I think, you know, Microsoft's really changed its perception with um, investors over the last year or two with this big shift, you know, firstly into cloud and now, you know, a kind of real uh, dark horse, if you like, on, on AI um, and you know, the, the, the relationship with chat, uh, with with OpenAI and ChatGPT and integrating that into their, their products has been a really important part of that. And it's, you know, a big incremental source of growth for Microsoft. So I think the fact they come out of this, you know, I, I think um, this, the Microsoft CEO's reputation has kind of gone up. I think he's handled mm. this incredibly well. You know, they, they move very quickly and very pragmatically uh, to protect what's kind of a key part of their future. Yeah, absolutely. Sam Altman saying building on a strong partnership with Microsoft. He also um, tweeted out a heart emoji in response to the announcement that he would return as CEO. And then Greg Brockman also uh, uh, saying this morning that re he's returning to OpenAI and getting back to coding tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, this is quite a kind of uh, turnaround, isn't it, in terms of what's oh, yeah, happening today? Yeah, yeah, really is. Yeah. Um, unprecedented, I think, in kind of uh, corporate. You know, we've seen some big kind of boardroom coups, but nothing quite this significant and playing out so, quite so quickly. OK, Matt Bloxham from Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you very much for joining us, reacting to that breaking news coming from OpenAI. 
Now, here in the UK, also today, uh, later on, will be the autumn statement from the Chancellor, which will aim to boost business investment by £20 billion per year. Now, one source has told Bloomberg that it will include making the, quote, full expensing tax break permanent. This is the one that allows businesses to claim a 25% tax rebate on investment. Other measures to come uh, include uh, the possibility of cuts to national insurance. Our senior UK economist, Dan Hansen, joins us now to look ahead then to the rest of the day. A focus in the lead up today, Dan, has been on how much money the Chancellor will actually have to play with. You know, the so-called fiscal headroom, ghastly phrase, but there we have it. What's your expectation around that amount? Yeah, morning, Caroline. Morning, Stephen. So, um, yeah, we, we we ran the numbers. We we came to a number of about eleven billion pounds, which, relative to March, so the March budget, the the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt had only six point five billion pounds. So, an improvement, but still a very small um, amount of headroom to use the to use the phrase. Um, I think actually listening to everything that's happened, particularly over the weekend and into the early part of this week. He might have a little bit more than that, given given what we're hearing. Um, and I think the reason why that would be the case and why we've potentially underestimated how much headroom he's got is that the OBR, which is the UK's fiscal watchdog, is going to take a potentially more optimistic view about um, the tax take and how much how much revenue the Treasury is going to get in. And that likely is to be will be driven by um, a much higher inflation forecast, essentially, because it's the cash size of the economy that matters for tax receipts. So I think our, our estimates probably at the low end, um, you, you know, we've got run some other numbers and we've got if you if you sort of put in a, our own inflation forecast, a forecast for inflation that's similar to the Bank of England, you get something closer to 25 to 30 billion. So a lot more, which is sort of nor- the sort of normal amount of headroom that chancellors have um have had in the past. So I think basically given what we've heard and everything we're we're hearing about policy, he's probably he's probably sitting prettier than he was um in March, where there was only a very small amount of headroom. Okay, so that opens up, of course, the the possibility for announcements and, and some of the ones that we have been expecting, sources telling Bloomberg about full expensing becoming permanent. This is something that business groups had wanted. It had been introduced as a temporary measure earlier this year. If the the goal is to boost business investment and boost the economy how effective is this measure in, in helping on that goal so I, I i'm quite excited about this one because i think um basically rishi sunak has has changed the way um the tax system looks at business investment and he's he's when he was chancellor he set out this idea that it's not corporation tax that boosts business investment because we had cuts to corporation tax through 2010 to 2019 and we didn't really get much of we got a response from business investment but we didn't get the sort of response that we might have expected given the falls in the headline rate of tax we've shifted to these allowances so full expensing is a is a capital allowance and we had this temporary um measure uh coming out of the pandemic the super deduction which appears to have had a very significant impact on business investment so I think it's this newer version of it. It's not quite as generous, this newer version. Nonetheless, I think it will deliver a pretty significant boost um, to business investment. And the fact that it is going from uh, temporary to permanent means that the boost is going to be um, experienced over a longer period of time. Um, you don't get this sort of near-term boost where firms just try and take advantage of the policy and then it, the policy expires. Actually, firms know it's in place for a longer period of time. There is certainty about that. And investment moves on to a high, up to a higher level. So I, I'm quite excited about this, and I think it's the right move. Mm, yeah. Okay. So that on business investment. Um, what else should we be watching out for then? Updated economic forecasts. What else do you think might kind of capture attention with the autumn statement later today? Well, we've had the news overnight, haven't we, that the, he's going to potentially cut NI uh, national mm. insurance, which is a payroll tax here in the UK. I mean, it looks quite small, the amount in terms of the app, how much it's going to cost, £5 billion. Pounds, but that's going to be that's going to be a big political point scoring um, move. Just on the forecast, Caroline, I mean, I think it's going to be interesting to see, um, first of all, about the fiscal arithmetic, which is sort of the in the answer to the first question, and also what the OBR says about the economic outlook, because it hasn't said anything since March. And a lot's changed since then. So, you know, how it how it needs to take on a much higher level of interest rates, 
how it sees the economy faring um, through the course of 2024. And I think the broader fiscal package as well, when you're thinking about the inflationary impact, you want to know not just what's happening on tax, you also want to know what's happening on spending and the overall impact on borrowing, because actually that's what will matter for, for when the Bank of England looks at this as to whether it thinks it needs to do anything in response. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, your morning brief on the stories making news from London to Wall Street and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed every morning on Apple, Spotify and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning on London DAB Radio, the Bloomberg Business app and Bloomberg.com. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day, right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe.